Well, as you're seated this morning, I want you to go ahead and grab your Bibles. Let's turn together to uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Well, if you're a sports fan, uh, it is uh, possible that you might recognize the two images of the two guys on the screen behind me. You, now, you may not know their names immediately, but you might uh, recognize their faces. The guy on the left is a guy by the name of John Wooden. The guy on the right is a coach by the name of Vince Lombardi. Now, John Wooden, the guy on the left, uh, was the head men's basketball coach for the UCL Bruins for, I don't know, maybe 27 years or so. And old John Wooden is uh, called by ESPN the greatest coach of the 20th century. And if you stop and think about that, that's like, a, that's like an incredible statement to make. In other words, it is quite likely that John Wooden is probably the greatest coach to ever live. In fact, his resume includes 10 national championships in 12 years. That includes seven national championships in a row. In fact, John Wooden's team at one point won a total of 88 games in a row without a loss, right? Like that's, that's pretty incredible stuff. The guy on the right um, is Vince Lombardi. Uh, and as you might have guessed from the picture, old Coach Lombardi was the longtime coach of the Green Bay Packers. Now, Part of the amazing thing about Coach Lombardi is that not only did he win five NFL championships and three of those in a row, he also never had a losing record the entire time he was a coach. Pretty impressive, right? But there's one thing that both of these guys have in common. Both of these guys were big on the basics. Like they were huge on the fundamentals, the first things of the game. In fact, so much so, every year, Coach Wooden wouldn't let his team on the court until he taught them one very important lesson. And that lesson was how you put on your socks. Like, can you imagine some of the greatest collegiate basketball players in the country coming to one of the greatest teams ever to be assembled, and the first thing that the coach wants to tell you before you ever shoot a basket is how to roll on your socks, right? Well, Coach Lombardi wasn't much better. In fact, the very first day of training camp in 1961, Coach Lombardi gathered his team together, many of whom, by the way, played in the Super Bowl the year before. And he started training camp by telling these professional football players these words, gentlemen, this is a football. And he would go on and he would describe to them the way that you score points, the dimensions of the field, the difference between the offense and the defense. Like these were professional football players. So why in the world did the coach, coaches start like this? And I think it's because if you can't get the first things right, then everything else that flows from that point is going to be flawed as well. Right? Like if you're foundation is wrong, then you will never be able to build anything that lasts for a while. And the reason I mention that today is because the same thing I would submit to you this morning is true in our spiritual life as well, right? Like, if we don't get the first things right, like if if we neglect and we compromise on the essentials of our faith, then everything from that point on is going to be affected. And as we near the end of our study of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, Paul is going to provide us in the days to come some of the clearest and most foundational words in all of Scripture. 
In fact, I believe if you were to make a list of some of the most significant chapters in all of the Bible, I believe that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 ought to be on that list. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 15 deals with the essence of our faith. In fact, in many ways, I think if the Apostle Paul were standing in front of us today and he were talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I think he would stand before us and say, brothers and sisters, this is the gospel. And so regardless this morning, of whether you have been a Christian for just a few weeks or you have been a Christian for the vast majority of your your life, my prayer for us this morning is that the truth of the gospel would come alive in our hearts and that these truths that we read this morning wouldn't just be cold, hard facts of an old, worn-out religion, but instead that God would cause these truths and these words to blow like a cool breeze across our hearts on this day. And so this morning, if you found 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want us to read just the first 11 verses of this incredible chapter together. So, if you've got 1 Corinthians 15, would you say amen this morning? Let's begin reading in verse 1. Scripture says, Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you have believed. Well, in case you haven't noticed this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is all about the resurrection of Christ and the church. And for the most part, Paul in this chapter is going to deal with the future resurrection of believers. And yet, in these first 11 verses, Paul is laying for us a foundation. And the foundation that he's laying for us is rooted chiefly in the resurrection of Jesus. Because once again, if we get the resurrection of Jesus wrong, then everything that flows from it, including our hope and salvation, will be flawed as well. And so Paul begins with what we might call the first things. And you notice in verse 3, he says, For I delivered to you what I received as of first importance. In other words, after spending most of the letter talking about all kinds of other issues and problems in the church, issues like wisdom and leadership and sex and marriage and singleness and divorce and lawsuits among believers and spiritual gifts and so many other things, it's almost as if Paul says to us, but but let me tell you the most important of all. Brothers and sisters, I think this is so helpful for us today. Because as followers of Christ, we can get so busy with good things that if we're not careful, we can neglect the most important thing. 
Like we can, we can get so caught up in talking about politics and world news and presidential debates and social justice issues that if we're not careful, we can neglect the most important thing to talk about at all, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And friends, I am convinced that the, what the enemy has done in the church is to distract us from that which is most essential. In fact, he, the enemy keeps us busy with things that are indeed important and yet not eternal. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about that which is of first importance. And oh, how I cannot wait to dive into this passage together in the days and weeks to come. And so this morning, as we dive into the text, this is what I want us to see. I want us to see three gospel-centered ideas in these first 11 verses. So if you're taking notes this morning, three gospel-centered ideas. The first gospel-centered idea that we find from the text is, number one, a reminder of the power in the gospel. A reminder of the power in the gospel. And Paul begins in verse 1 by saying, Now I would remind you, brothers... And that word brothers there is not gender specific. In other words, Paul is not just talking to the dudes in the room, right? This is a term of endearment. It's a term of affection. This is a message that is for all the brothers and sisters who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And this is actually quite interesting if you think about it. Because the people that Paul is reminding about the gospel is the same people who have already accepted the gospel. In other words, he's reminding the saved about what the gospel really is. And I know this is, I know this is perhaps somewhat of a subtle thought, but I actually think it's a pretty big deal. Because it's not just the unbelievers and those who don't know Christ that need to hear the gospel, right? Like even we as followers of Christ need to be reminded of the gospel because the reality is I need to preach the gospel to myself on a daily basis because I don't know about you, but I am prone to wander. I mean, I can easily forget where my help comes from. I can quite naturally fall back into a pattern where my faith is rooted in what I do rather than what Christ has done for me. And so Paul says right out of the gate, I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, of what you already know. And what is it? What is it that they already know? They know the power of the gospel. In fact, in, in the text, Paul gives us a glimpse into how the gospel transforms our lives. So as we think about the power of the gospel in our lives, I, I want us to also see just four aspects of saving faith that come in these first couple of verses. So in the first two verses, thinking about the overarching category of the power of the gospel, notice four aspects of saving faith. The first aspect of saving faith is, number one, gospel proclamation. Paul says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you. Do you see that? So how was the gospel made known? Well, quite simply, through the proclamation of God's word. In fact, this is actually at the heart of what that word gospel actually means. You see, the word gospel comes from the Greek word euangelion. Literally means good news or good tidings. It's a, it's a word that was used even in the Roman word, world for an announcement that, that typically was associated with the king or, or the Caesar. So, for example... If a new Caesar was born or a new emperor came on the throne, a euangelion would go out into all the world. It was, a, it was a Roman gospel message announcing the good news of a new king. 
In other words, at the, at the very core of this idea of the gospel is the need for a proclamation. In fact, the only way that the nations will know of the goodness of Jesus, the only way that the nations will know of the saving work of Christ, the only way that your neighbor or your friend or your coworker will know of the good news of the message of the cross is if you proclaim it to them. Right? Like I know there are are many who, who might like the Old quote from St. Francis Assisi, who apparently said, supposedly said, there's quite debate about whether he actually said it or not, but there are some who would say that he said these words, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Now, friends, I know that sounds really good. And the reason it sounds good is because we we like the idea of people living out authentically their faith in front of other people. And listen, we, we should certainly do that. But the reality is, saving faith will always require us to actually use our words. Right? Like salvation doesn't come simply because I take my neighbor's trash to the curb every week. Right? No, that, that's good, and, and we should do that. That's, that's loving, and perhaps that may even open doors for me to be able to share the gospel with them. But listen, the only way that they will know the true message of the cross is if we actually use our words to share it with them. Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 14, he says, How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe on him in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just a couple verses later, Paul says in verse 17 of Romans chapter 10, he says, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Which is why when we gather from Sunday to Sunday, the greatest message that could be declared in this place is the message of the cross and the preaching of the word of God. Because listen, saving comes through gospel proclamation. But then Paul also mentions a second aspect of saving faith, and that is gospel reception. Notice what Paul says. He says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel, one, I preached to you, and two, which you, what? Received. Now, you may hear that, and you may think, well, this is, this is a pretty elementary thought process here. But I actually think it's so vitally important, because saving faith isn't just something that you hear. It's actually something that you receive. Because the truth of the matter is, listen, you could come together every single Sunday and hear the proclamation of the gospel. Like you you could hear consistently throughout your lifetime gospel-centered messages and go to gospel-centered meetings. But listen, your proximity to hearing the gospel will not save you any more than going to Whataburger is going to make you a hamburger. Right? Right? Like the gospel is something that you must actually receive. Yes, it's a a free gift, but it's a free gift that you must accept for yourself because while it might be available to all, it doesn't mean that all have accepted it. In fact, Jesus would say in John chapter 1, verse 11, he says, or John would say of Jesus in John 1, 11, he says, he, meaning Jesus, came to his own, But his own people did not what? Receive him. And you think about that for a second. But those who were in proximity to Jesus didn't automatically receive the word that was spoken. And yet even as you think about that sobering thought, John chapter 1 verse 12 continues. But oh, it is such good news because 
John says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Now listen, this is, this is good news. Because every single one of us in this room has a choice to either reject or receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to those who receive him and believe in his name, oh, listen, they are the ones who are adopted into the family of God. They they are the ones who the old is made new, the death is defeated, and our life is now no longer defined by past mistakes, but now by the future glory that is ours in Christ, right? Because like all gifts, you must... Accept and receive this as your own. And then the third aspect that Paul mentions in these first two verses of saving faith is number three, what I just call gospel foundation. So Paul says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, and in which you stand. Do you notice that this is a present reality, right? Like, Like, how do you know this morning, if you're in this room, how do you know that you are truly saved? Do you ever wonder about that question? Well, Paul seems to be reminding us today that our salvation has come because, one, there was a time in our life when someone proclaimed the gospel to us. Then, number two, we received this as true, but then don't miss this. Because saving faith isn't just something that we received at one point in our life when we walked an aisle or filled out a card or texted a phone number on a TV screen. Oh, listen, that that may have been the day of salvation, but saving faith is actually a present tense reality. That has present tense implications in your life and mine. You see, as followers of Christ, the gospel is the place where we stand. The gospel is is the foundation of our life. The gospel is the anchor of our soul. And everything else in our life is influenced by this present tense reality. And what is the present tense reality? Oh, listen, the present tense reality of saving faith is to acknowledge, listen, I am not my own. Like I have been bought with a price. I've been redeemed by the Lamb. And although I do not deserve it, and although I could not have earned it, I stand on the unfathomable grace of God. Because listen, the story of the redeemed is the story that says, I once was dead, but now I am alive. I was once blind, but now I see. I was once a rebel from the heart of God, but now I am a rescued and redeemed child of God. And because of that, the gospel now informs every aspect of my life. And so I ask you, how do you know this morning if you are saved? Well, perhaps the answer to that question is to say, What is it that you're standing on? Like, what is it that your soul is tethered to today? What is it that your life is currently being built on? Is it the gospel of Jesus Christ, or is it some other affection in this world? Because those who experience saving faith, listen, they will never get over what Christ has done for them on the cross. And they will build their life on that solid rock. Which leads us to the fourth aspect of saving faith. And that is number four, gospel formation. Gospel formation. I love, oh man. I love the way that Paul describes the gospel work in the life of a believer. Notice what he says in verse 2. He says, and by which you are 
being saved. Notice the verb tenses in the text. Because when Paul talks about the power of the gospel at work in our lives, he talks about it in three tenses, does he not? There's the past tense, that we received the gospel. And when we received the gospel, we were set free from the penalty of our sin. Then there's the present tense, in which we now stand. So we are currently being saved from the power of sin. And then in verse 2, Paul says that we are being saved. And this has both implications in the present tense, but also in the future. In other words, church, when you accepted Christ, you weren't merely canceling your ticket to hell and punching your ticket into heaven. We were actually being transformed and are being transformed into the image of God's Son. And listen, don't make any mistake about it. At salvation, there was a positional change. We do have a new forwarding address because of our faith in Jesus Christ. But the power of the gospel isn't just a power to get us from earth to heaven. It is actually a power to transform our lives in this day, even today. You see, as followers of Christ, our testimony Our testimony as followers of Christ is, listen, I'm not yet everything that God maybe wants me to be, but praise God, I'm not what I used to be. Amen? Because hear me, the church. The truth of the matter is God is still working on me, and he is still working on you. And I have been saved, but I am also saved being saved, and there is coming a day when I will be saved. And until that day comes, I'm going to hold fast to the word of God, and I'm going to trust that the same God who saved me from the penalty of sin is working in me to free me from the power of sin, so that one day I will be with him in a place where I am free from the presence of sin. Because brothers and sisters, listen, this is the power of the gospel at work. Amen? All this leads us then to the second gospel-centered idea in the text. So we've got a reminder, but then secondly, we also have a declaration. Number two, a declaration of the truth in the gospel. So if you follow Paul's train of thought after he reminds us in the first two verses about the way that the gospel has worked in our lives, he now turns in verses 3 through 8 to describe the essence of what the gospel actually is. And you notice that this isn't a message Paul says that I made up. Do you see that in verse 3? Verse 3 he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Again, notice the verbs here, delivered and received. So Paul, like an Olympic athlete who's running a race, what Paul's indicating here is he simply took the gospel baton from those who were before him and he passed it along to those within the church of Corinth. He says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, he says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me was not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And what exactly did he receive? In other words, what exactly is the gospel? Paul Paul helps us in such practical ways in the text. He gives us a a, a nutshell of what the gospel is in two very simple ideas. Those simple ideas is number one. You see it in verse three. Christ died on our behalf. So what is the gospel in its most simple form? Well, Paul says it's 
that Christ died on our behalf. In fact, according to the scriptures, here's the truth that every one of us in this room need to, need to know. Every single one of us, at one time, in our, one time or another, in our life has turned our back on God. Some of us in small ways, others in big ways. But whether big or small, we've all rebelled against. We've all chosen to be the captain of our own ship. And in the process of that, what sin has done is our sin has separated us from God. You see, the truth of the matter is God is a holy and just God. And he cannot tolerate sin, nor be in the presence of sin. Which means you and I have a problem, right? Because on our own, we have... We have nothing to offer God as a payment for our sin. Like there's, there's not enough good that you and I could ever do to make up for what we have done. There aren't enough prayers that we could pray. There's not enough worship services that we could attend. There's not enough money that we could give to absolve us from our sins. No, listen. We stand before God as one guilty. And yet this is where the good news comes in. Because God, in his great love for us, sent his one and only son to live the perfect life that we could not live and to die the brutal death that you and I deserved. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. And the only way that we stand before a holy God is if we become holy. And the only way that we can become holy is through the one who died on our behalf. And scripture tells us that if, that if we confess our sins, that, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. If we, if we believe that Christ died on our behalf, listen, we will have both reconciliation with God and life eternal with him. My friend, listen, this is the invitation to all in this room today. But that's not all. Because not only did Christ die for you, but number two, second part of the gospel, in its simplicity, Christ also was buried and raised. Now, the reason this is so important is because while Christ's death on the cross paid for our sins, Christ's resurrection is a declaration that his sacrifice is enough for us. Romans chapter 4, verse 25, Jesus, Scripture says, Jesus was delivered up for our sins and raised for our justification. In other words, church, listen. If the resurrection of Jesus was not real, then neither is our justification before God. Which means that we are still guilty in our sin before him. And yet the good news of the gospel is not only did Jesus die on our behalf, not only was Jesus buried in plain sight, but three days later, listen, the grave could not hold him. Three days later, he rose in glorious victory. And, and the proof of this is not just the, the random testimony of a few people. But Paul says, no, listen, Peter saw it. The other 12 saw it. In fact, Paul says, Jesus appeared to 500 others who are at the time, many of whom still alive. And if you don't believe me, go ask them, he says, right? In fact, what I love about this story is through the story of the gospel, you begin to realize just how far God was willing to go to save us from separation with him. And again, this invitation is for all, even on this day. 
which leads us to the final thing that I want us to see in the text, and that is number three, the goodness of God's grace in the gospel. Did you notice that? In verses 9 through 11, I can't help but imagine Paul as he's just reflecting on his own life in verses 9 through 11 as he's reflecting on the goodness of the gospel. It's almost as if Paul knows, like deep in his bones, that there is, there's nothing about him that should cause God to pay any attention to him at all. Like deep in his bones, Paul knew that he was completely unworthy of seeing and encountering the risen Christ for himself. In fact, he says in verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. And listen, there are some of you in the sound of my voice today that when you think about the love of God, it almost sounds too good to be true. It almost sounds like a, a fairy tale to you. Because given all that you've done, given all that you've said, given all that you've experienced in your life, you may think to yourself, there is no way that God would ever take notice of me. There is no way that God would ever love me. And I want you to hear this morning that God's grace is enough for you. Like, listen, Paul was a terrorist. Like, he lived and breathed to do whatever it took to stop the advance of the gospel in this world. And yet God, by his grace, caused the light of the risen Christ to shine on his heart. And when that happened, listen, his life was changed forever. In fact, when you look at what Paul says in verse 10, he says, but, and listen to this, he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me, he says, was not in vain. And there are some of you in this room who hear, need to hear this this morning. There's some of you in this room who need to get a fresh glimpse of the grace of God. Like you have been wallowing in your guilt and your shame. You have allowed your past mistakes to hinder your current relationship. You've allowed your heart to grow cold and distant from the heavenly Father. And yet the testimony that comes roaring across the pages of Paul's story today is, listen to me, church, God's grace is enough for you. His grace is enough. And there's nothing that you have done, and there's nothing that you could do that the love of God cannot overcome. And brothers and sisters, would you hear me this morning from 1 Corinthians 15? Hear me to say that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is proof of just how far he is willing to go to extend his hand of mercy and grace to all who would receive it as their own. Which is why the gospel in your life and mine, which is why the gospel from week to week as we gather in this place must be of first importance. Because the truth of the matter is the gospel is the only thing that can transform this world. The gospel is the only thing that can transform all that we find ourselves facing in this life today. Listen, whoever is elected the President of the United States a few months from now does not have the power to change lives like the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can talk 
all day long about whether you like it or don't like what is being said. But what we can all agree on is the gospel is the solution to the problems of the world. And brothers and sisters, this is what we must stand on. This is what we must build our life on. And this is what we must proclaim louder than anything else in this world today. Because our Savior isn't in that tomb. He arose as proof that he can change you and me today. Amen.